Okay, welcome everyone to Drisha's spring program and the first class in this four uh, class series on death and the afterlife in the rabbinic and Kabbalistic imagination. We encourage everyone to turn on their video so we can feel like we're uh, together in a class. A few words about this class. Uh, Jewish death rituals are famous for their existential pro profund <laughs> sorry, profundity and psychological insight concerning our most difficult times. Less well known is the vast treasury of myths about death and the afterlife that undergrid those rituals. These myths go back to the beginning of Judaism, flower in rabbinic literature, and reach their fullest elaboration in Kabbalah. We will study a selection of this rabbinic and Kabbalistic myths, particularly those in the Zohar, the central work of Kabbalah. Shakespeare may have declared that death is the undiscovered country, but we will study the journeys of the Jewish imagination deep into its innermost provinces. The only requirement for this course is that you would be willing to employ your imagination, your mind, and your soul to engage with this overwhelming and often shattering feature of the human condition. It is my pleasure to introduce both Rabbi David Silver and Dr. Nathaniel Berman. Rabbi Silver is the founder and dean of Drisha Institute for Jewish Education in New York and in Israel. Dr. Berman holds the Rachel Vernhagen Chair at Brown University, where he teaches in the Religious Studies Department. Nathaniel's writings and teachings span a number of disciplines. As a legal historian, his work has focused on the modern construction of the nation and religion in tandem with the international. He's the author of, among many other publications, uh, Passion and Ambivalence, Nationalism, Colonialism, and Inter Inter International Law. In Jewish studies, his work has focused on classical Kabbalah, particularly the Zohar. He has taught widely in this field in the New York area, as well as at Brown. His book, Divine and Demonic, in the Poetic Mythology of the Zohar, the Other Side of Kabbalah will be published this year by Brill. And with that, I'll turn this to uh, Dr. Berman and Rabbi Silver. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for all being here on this weekday night um, to discuss this most challenging, most grave, um, and most intriguing of themes. Um, I want to thank Trisha for hosting this event. I want to thank David for co-teaching with me, as he has so many times in the past, and it's always a pleasure. Um, and uh, I also want to thank someone who I'm not sure is here, but I'm going to thank him now, and I'm going to thank him when he shows up if he if he can if he does is able to make it, which is Rabbi Dr. Simcha Raphael, who uh, literally wrote the book on this subject about 30 years ago. Uh, and those of us who write in it um, are really uh, in, deeply indebted to him. So I want to, uh, in, in the Jewish way, uh, say something in the name of one who said it in order to bring redemption to the world. Um, and without further ado, I want to plunge in um, with something other, another introductory point. So this is the, for those of you who, who just arrived, this is sort of the cover or the, 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 the theme um, of these uh, sessions, of these four sessions, death and afterlife and rabbinic and Kabbalistic imaginations. Um, I've actually deleted the definite article uh, because this is gonna be a taste in four sessions. We can only really have a taste. Um, on this cover, I've put a painting by Marc Chagall from 1908 called The Deceased or Death, um, a very, very interesting painting um, one of many that he did that is on this theme. Um, and we could spend many hours talking about this one painting, but I just put it there for your uh, contemplation. Now, the first thing I wanna say, and this is still by way of introduction, is this theme of 903 paths. Um, 903 paths, and you'll see where I got this from in a second. I want to recognize that everyone on this screen, everyone in this virtual room, is here for their own reasons. Uh, some people are here because they are dealing with intimate loss in their lives. Uh, some people are here because of 
interest in Jewish stuff in general. Some people are here because of philosophical or existential or historical interest in this theme. Um, people come out of this at this theme in particular from so many different ways. And I'm not sure of how many people we have in the room right now, but there are at least as many uh, uh, interests and concerns as there are people. Actually, there are probably twice as many different interests and concerns as there are people. And so I wanted to start off with this theme of 903 paths. And where do I get this 903 from? Well, it turns out it's from the Talmud. The Talmud in Masechet Brachot says, Tanya Chameot Mita It has been taught. 903 kinds of death were created in the world. And then in an, an extra Talmudic text, there is a commentary on this. It says, Udebeit Nisan Zute Amrein, Ofhachi Kegavnada Lagabe Abeirut Olamaba. And the school of Nisan, the lesser, they say, it is exactly the same way with mourning and with the world to come. That there are 903 paths, 903 kinds, 903 reasons that people are interested in this subject, at least 903. And even though there are, I see 81 participants, I am confident that there are at least 903 interests um, uh, present in this room. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to say before we begin is because we have a lot of people, I'm going to ask you to put questions in the chat um, and uh, periodically I'll, I'll, I'll peruse the chat and, and maybe address that and maybe David also address some of those questions in the chat. Um, so 903 paths, here we are. Um, and we're gonna do a, a tasting of this unbelievably rich literature um, on death and afterlife in the Jewish tradition in two specific periods. Um, and uh, um, I want to say one more thing by way of introduction, which is a lot of these texts can be read in many different ways. In fact, a lot of the texts about death that I teach are almost like Rorschach tests. And I read them one way and I could, it's a text I could have been reading for years or decades. And I read them one way and then I teach it in a class and I find that somebody in the class reads it in a completely different way that sometimes I think, wow, that, and, um, and that's, a, that's an amazing thing about these kinds of texts. None of these texts are philosophical or theoretical texts. They're all uh, imagin imag imaginative texts. They're all poetic texts. They're all speak to your imagination and to your experience. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. So those are the 903 kinds of death. And it actually, people interested, actually comes from a gematria, but I'm not going to go through that now. Okay, death and higher wisdom. It's sort of the first theme. And I just want to get at some major themes uh, tonight um, as the first of our four sessions together. Death and higher wisdom. Now, people familiar with, say, the Western philosophical tradition know that this is a big theme. Plato you know, one of the inaugurators of the Western tradition of philosophy said, uh, or has Socrates say in the, in the dialogue called the Phaedo, he says, life, philosophy is preparation for death. A life lived in philosophy is preparation for death. And he goes on to explain that the philosopher who, who, who lives in the mind, lives in the soul, welcomes the separation of the soul from the body because the body just gets in the way of philosophy. Um, that's Plato. In the very inaugural time of Western philosophy, about two and a half millennia ago, a more recent philosophical figure, extremely influential, though had some rather unsavory aspects to his life, Martin Heidegger in the early 20th century said that in almost the opposite way, he said only when you confront death can you live an authentic life? So confrontation with death and acknowledging mortality is essential for living an authentic life. Playing with Plato, almost turning him on his head. Um, but what they have in common is this notion that this encounter with death is 
in some way the key to some kind of higher wisdom. Now I'm gonna show you now a quote from another early 20th century thinker, Walter Benjamin, um, a, sort of a, a, a jack of all trades, um, cultural critic, philosopher, um, imaginative writer, um, social theorist. Um, and he, his life uh, came to a tragic end, escaping from the Nazis in 1940 on the French-Spanish border. He wrote this in 1936 in an essay, famous essay called The Storyteller. And he says this, as a person's life comes to an end, suddenly their expressions and looks impart to everything that concerned them that authority, which even the poorest wretch in dying possesses for the living around them. This authority is at the very source of the story. Um, what he's saying here is that when somebody's dying, people gather around them to hear their last words. That there's a sense in which someone's last words have a kind of holiness to them, a kind of higher wisdom to them. And he says, even the poorest wretch, even if you saw someone dying on the street, maybe perhaps someone who you would have just walked by and not paid any attention to, but when they're dying, somehow there's an attribution of higher wisdom to them. And people wanna hear, what did they say? What were their last words? Right? That's a sort of a secular version of something I'm about to read, right? That somehow that that liminal space, that liminal time, that threshold between life and death is viewed at this as this time of higher wisdom, higher vision, higher insight. And very much in this tradition of a encounter with death somehow confirms a conf uh, confers a higher wisdom on everyone, even on someone who you would not have given the time of day to, undoubtedly unjustly, in their lifetime. And here is the Kabbalistic version of this. So here is a passage from the Zohar. The Zohar, as many of you may know, is the central work of Kabbalah. Um, mostly written in the late 13th century in Spain and all of Kabbalah really after it is, a, is more or less of a commentary in the Zohar was written in Aramaic. It's really an amazingly beautiful work. And I'm gonna quote it a lot in our time together. So this is on the, from the Zohar on the moment of death. When a person lies on their deathbed and judgment looms over them, a higher spirit which they never had before is joined to them or is added to them, would be another way of translating this. They then see, or they then can see what they had never attained all their days, what they had never merited to see all their days because that spirit, that extra spirit has been joined to them, has been added to them. The dying person as a kind of prophet as getting this extra spirit. And they can all of a sudden see things they've never been able to see before. And this is the Jewish mystical version of some of these secular ideas that I've just laid out. And the Zohar continues and says, as it is joined to them and they see that which they've never been able to see before, they depart from this world as it is written. A uh, uh, verse from Tehillim, you add their spirit, then they perish and return to their dust. By the way, if you look up this verse in Tehillim, you'll see that in context, it means something completely different, actually the opposite more or less, but this is, this is the Zohar's reading of it. Similarly, the Zohar continues, the famous verse from Exodus from Shmot, no person can see me and live, lo yirani hadam v'chai. In their lifetime, they cannot attain this but in their death they can. Now the, this verse is often interpreted to mean that no, no human being can see God because God has no, nothing to see. But what they're saying here is yes, there is something to see, but not in your lifetime. No person can see me and live, but a dying person can see. And here they're, they're actually hinting at the notion that the dying person can actually see God. That's what they're saying. 
well, it says more or less explicitly here, um, that there's somehow a special kind of vision, a special kind of insight that we see in Benjamin that Plato talks about, that, Aristotle, that, that Heidegger talks about. And here we have it as actually some kind of prophetic vision that the dying person has. That actually cannot be sustained in life, according to in the Zohar here. Now, I don't pretend that in our time together, we're going to be able to have the kind of vision or who knows, that would actually be an amazing thing. But don't worry if you don't see God during our time together. Um, we we're only talking about death. We're not actually experiencing it. But even so, an encounter with death, this very, very profound topic, right, is something that in, in the Western philosophical tradition and in the Jewish mystical tradition, as we've just seen, is something that confers a kind of a higher insight, a higher vision, a some kind of even prophetic vision. Um, Nathaniel? Yes. Just I wanted to put out a question without making a comment. Yes. Because in the in the Torah, actually, the Torah ties those two things together. It's eating of the tree of knowledge that incurs death. So clearly, starting with the beginning of the Chumash, there's some kind of connection between those two, which is very profound. It's two basic pieces of the human being, human experience, to know and to die seem in the Chumash to be intertwined in some way. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to think about that more as we proceed, but already in the Torah, the two are linked. Yes, definitely. And actually five slides from now, we're actually gonna read that very verse. <laughs> but no, that's true. There is some kind, of, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful connection, right? That knowing and mortality, and, and it also very much relates to Heidegger, this notion of the, the encounter with death, the knowledge of death, the full internalization of mortality and the confrontation with mortality as for in Heidegger, the only way to really live authentically. Um, so I want to, uh, my next theme here is paradoxes and ambivalences. Again, this is our first evening together. Um, and I want to put out some, some themes, some basic themes, um, and a few paradoxes and ambivalences. So the first one is what I call this uh, ambivalence between a portrayal of death as quotidian and the death as cosmic cataclysm. <coughs> and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Quotidian daily is that something that one is supposed to be experiencing all the time or is it this cataclysmic event? And, that, and I'm gonna explain now what I mean through these passages. So the first one uh, is a very interesting passage um, whose idea I think many people will recognize when I get to the next slide. So this is actually from the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud or Palestinian Talmud from Masachet Brachot. And it says in the school of Rabbi Yanai, they say, one who awakens from sleep must say, blessed are you God who revives the dead. Right? When you wake from sleep, you say, blessed are you who revives the dead. Okay? That waking up from sleep is a kind of resurrection. I'll take that in for a second. That means that the encounter with death is not something that happens once in a lifetime, but this vision, which this, 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 this perspective of which there are many different formulations in Talmudic uh, uh, writing, is that one should be experiencing the cycle of life and death constantly in your lives, at least every day, at least every day. So that the death life division is fractally inscribed in life. By fractal, I mean, it's, it's not just there's all your life, then there's death. It's that death life is constantly happening every single day and every day it happens. And if you think this is a very surprising passage, here's something that probably most people on the screen know. The famous Modani. Modani lefanecha melechai v'kayam shechzarte b'nishmati b'chamla rabba amunatecha. 
make acknowledgement before you, living and enduring king, that you have returned my neshama, my soul to me with compassion. Great is your faithfulness. This is the prayer that everyone is supposed to say in the morning. We teach this prayer to children. Although once I realized what this was about, I have a lot of doubts about why this is taught to children. This is really saying, I die at night. And when I get up in the morning, I thank God for returning my soul to me. It's the same exact idea as in the Talmudic passage, that every night's sleep is a kind of death. And in the morning, it's a kind of resurrection, as said right, says right here in the, uh, in this, uh, um, in, the, in this fa most famous, perhaps the most famous, besides the Shema of the Jew of Jewish prayers, the Modani, which you can hear school children reciting. Although it's, I would, I would, I would reform that practice myself because it's really about this daily death. Um, this prayer was written, or at least the first record of we have it, is from written by a Kabbalist in Svat in the 16th century, Moshe Ibn Machir, um, in his Seder Hayom. Um, it's the first record of this formulation, although the basic idea goes back to uh, Talmudic times and is elaborated then in Kabbalah in the 13th century and afterwards. And Nathaniel? Yes. Not just it's not just elaborate, not only elaborated in Talmudic times, it's in our sitter every morning. Yes. And I'm quite sure the Mode Ali is actually modeled on that blessing. Yes. So it's yes. not just the blessing you cited from the Rushami, which we don't say, but we do say the other blessing, which is I think a very beautiful blessing that God restores every day is a is a new opportunity, is a new day or whatever. It's put in terms of restoration of the soul. And by the way, there is a famous a, a poem, uh, which I also is a very many beautiful tunes to it. The uh, tagline of which may feel is Viran Yachad Kochei Volke, which is essentially the same idea that every day God, God checks us out every day and sees whether we are worthy of, of our soul being restored to us. And there's a, a Practice among some, some, I think Sephardim say that every every day, and some Ashkenazim say it certain times of the year, or maybe Rosh Hashanah, maybe Shavuot morning, or whatever. So it's it's very present in the uh, in the Siddur, actually. Yes, completely. And but I do I I also think that most people don't confront it, right? Um, and I think that the just really taking it in. Uh, uh, and I think the evidence by the fact that it's it's sung by small children um, as as young as two, three, three, four. Um, if I think that if one took that in, that every night one is faced with a death, it gives a completely different cast to things. And again, it, um, internalizing death fractally into life um, as a daily experience. So now here's the opposite idea. And again, this is from the Zohar. Um, and this is about the herald of death that proclaims for each human life, each human being who dies, there's a herald of death. Right? There's a kariz when the proclamation proclaims, or when the herald of death proclaims. And this happens for each and every individual human being is a cosmic event. So this is almost the opposite idea. Not quite, but almost the opposite idea that it is a, an event that shakes the entire cosmos. And there are many different versions of this in the Zohar. When the herald of death proclaims, a flame issues from the side of the North. And we're talking here, the cosmic North, the side of judgment in the, in the cosmos and the divine. A flame issues forth from the side of the North and blazes in the river of fire. This river of fire that Ahad Dinur is mentioned in the book of Daniel as flowing in front of the throne of God. This flame issues forth from the side of the north, blazes in the river of fire, spreads out in the four dimensions of the world or the cosmos, and burns the soul of the wicked. That every person's death causes a blazing up of the river of fire and actually increases the torments of the souls in hell. That flame shoots forth up and down through the world 
and reaches the wings of the black rooster. And this is just not any old black rooster. It's the cosmic black rooster associated with the angel Gabriel striking its wings and it crows at the opening between the gates. This is the, I, this is the opposite idea. Every single person's death, every single person causes the entire cosmos to tremble. And we'll look at other formulations of this as we go along. Every single person's death causes the cosmos to tremble. And the fire blazes up in front of God and the river of fire in front of God and the, the, the fires of hell blaze more brightly and this proclamation goes forth. And what does this proclamation say, you might ask? Well, actually it's the rooster. The first time it cries, see the death for Hashem is coming, burning like a furnace. That's a, that's a, it's actually, the Zohar actually slightly misquotes a pasuk from uh, Malachi. Um, and this pasuk from Malachi is actually uh, uh, quoted in, in Midrash Rabbah as a proof for the existence of hell, of Gehinom. The second time it cries, another verse, for see, he forms mountains and creates wind and declares to a person their own thoughts. And again, the Zohar has a, the shot of this, the, the plain meaning of this verse is somewhat different than the Zohar uses it, but that is what the Zohar means by it. That it's a time when at the time of death, the person's thoughts, their entire, actually their, all their deeds are recounted before them. It's a time of judgment. At that moment, a person sits among his deeds, which testify before him, and he confesses them. So the moment of death is this moment of reliving one's entire life. As we say commonly, your whole life passes before you, and they testify and you confess them. The third time, as they are about to extract his soul, the rooster cries, who would not fear you, O king of the nations? Pasuk from now this vision of each, again, each human being's death as shaking the cosmos, again, it's sort of at the opposite extreme of this daily cycle of death and resurrection, right? It obviously gives this incredible meaning, incredible preciousness to each individual human being that each individual human being's death is worthy of this kind of cosmically shaking uh, experience. Um, and I wanted to put that out there um, as well. Um, one second. Okay, I'm gonna take like, like two questions and then I'm gonna go on. Um, Oh, somebody named Chaya Juni has this really interesting comment that the rooster, of course, is, an, is, the, is the bird of awakening. Very, very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, that's a really great, great, fantastic. Um, someone put in the chat, are you comparing quotidian resurrections with actual death? That is a great question. And that is a question, that's the kind of excellent question that I want to not answer, that I want you to think about it. I don't want to answer that question. I want, I want that question to be a question from which you think. What is the tradition teaching us exactly when it says, in the morning you should say, Baruch Hashem achayem etim, or Modena litni lefanecha, Baruch Hashem machazir nashamot lefagarim etim. What is the tradition really saying to us? So that's a excellent, really great question. Um, uh, so, somebody named Jessica wrote, uh, wrote, I always heard it translated as know me in life. So wouldn't that mean in that death is the only way to really know God? Now, I also want to leave that as a question, right? That's also a fantastic question. I also want to leave that as a question, right? Remember, I quoted that, that uh, those Western philosophers who said that a, an encounter with death is one of the paths to true wisdom. And we get that in Benjamin, and we get it in the Zohar. 
right? Maybe, maybe, maybe the Zohar is saying, well, if you can really take this on board, right? The morta mortality and really live with the knowledge of mortality, experiencing the daily cycle of death and life, maybe that's also a path to a higher wisdom and maybe even to a vision of God. I just wanna put it out there as a possibility. Thank you for those wonderful comments. Um, I'm gonna go on now. Sorry, I didn't get to all of them, but we have a lot of people. Um, okay, this next, next paradoxes and ambivalences. Um, and here's an example of where, um, uh, uh, as so often, certain cliches about Judaism uh, turn out to be not true upon more uh, close scrutiny, especially in light of the Kabbalistic tradition, um, but even not in this case. Is death inextricable from the human condition or was it due to the original sin? Or one might say, leave out the the, or was it due to original sin? And here's the verse from Breshit that David mentioned, where God says to Adam and Eve, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it for the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Right. This clear connection between knowledge, as David put it, and death, right? And what does that mean? And the day that you eat from the tree of knowledge, you will die. What does that mean? Right? So that's a question, right? There are many different ways of interpreting this. For example, maybe you will die, actually die at that moment. Right? Um, maybe it means that you'll know that you're going to die that you'll know that you're immortal. Could mean a lot of things. Okay. Here's a quick example of something it could mean. This is from the Ramban, the great towering intellectual figure um, of mid uh, 13th century Spain, both a Talmudist and a Kabbalist, and as well wrote uh, uh, the, the, this monumental and classic commentary on the Torah. And this is just from his commentary on Breshit. He says, from the time you eat of it, you will become mortal. That's what he says. You'll become mortal. Right? And he really means that. And it, it's a long discussion there. He means, in other words, that before Adam and Eve ate of the tree, human beings were not going to be mortal. They were immortal. That's what he says. That's what he means there. And if you look at it in context, he, he goes on to discuss it for paragraphs, but it's quite clear that that's his meaning. Tia ben Mabet, meaning that you will become mortal. And that is generally the Kabbalistic interpretation, certainly in the Zohar, it's all over the places we'll see in a moment. But before we get there, let's look at the Talmud. Not talking about this particular verse, although it's undoubtedly in the background, but there's a long debate in Masachet Shabbat about whether human beings are inherently mortal or is more, did mortality come into the world through, uh, is mortality a result of sin and in particular of the original sin? So I'm just gonna run through this. Rabami said, there is no death without sin. As it is written, the soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The verse from Yechezkel. An objection was raised, and there's a long, I've just given you excerpts from this long, long discussion. An objection was raised from a brighter. The ministering angel said before the blessed Holy One, master of the universe, why did you penalize Adam with death? Now we, this question means that before Adam, that Adam was not supposed to die at all because we know he didn't die right away when he ate, the, when he ate the, the, from the tree. Why did you penalize it? No, why did you make Adam mortal? He said to them, I gave him a simple mitzvah and he violated it. They said to him, ministering angels, did not Moses and Aaron who observed the whole Torah in its entirety die? Right? So they're, they're saying, but, but what about Moses and Aaron? They didn't sin. Uh, okay, well, I know that they also sinned and that also enters into the discussion, but the angels here have the premise that they never sinned and yet they also died. He, and this is God in this story, responded with a verse from Kohelet, there is but one fate 
for the wicked and the righteous. One fate for the righteous and the wicked. So God seems to be saying, it doesn't matter if you sin or not. So we first say, God's first thing is, there's death in the world because of sin. And then they say, what about Moses and Aaron? He says, oh, actually you're right. There is but one fate for the righteous and the wicked. Everyone dies regardless of sin. So that's, those are two different positions. And then the third position, another objection was raised from a bright. Four people died solely due to the counsel of the serpent to Adam. In other words, the original sin. Four people died solely because of the original sin and not because of their own sin. And they are Benjamin, the son of Jacob, Amram, the father of Moses, Yeshai, the father of David, and Kilav, the son of David. Those four people, this Brita says, only died because of the original sin. They had none of their own sins. So there are three different positions in this Talmudic passage. One is everyone dies because of their own sin. One is people die just because people were made mortal. That's God's fallback position after challenged by the, challenged, being challenged by the angels. And the third position is everyone dies because of original sin as well as because of their own sin. Three different positions in the Talmud. It's a long discussion going back and forth, bringing in Breitot. Obviously, there, are, there were a number of different traditions during the Talmudic centuries on this question of the relationship of mortality. Is mortality a tragedy or is it natural? I just finished teaching a semester long course at Brown um, on, on death to a group of about 50 undergraduates. And I started off with a lot of poetry because um, I wanted to give them permission to have a lot of different positions on death. And the, it was really amazing how the class sort of divided among people who really felt death was natural. We, I had a poem by Mary Elizabeth Fry really portraying death as purely natural. Marcus Aurelius also has that idea. And those who view death as, as a tragedy, as a misfortune, as something to rage against, as in the famous poem by Dylan Thomas, rage, rage against the dying of the light. And this Talmudic discussion really mirrors some of that, some of those differences of views and differences of existential stances that were present uh, among my students. Um, Nathaniel, um, yes. I had two comments to make about, um, one of them may take us a bit of far, in which case just stop me and we'll, I'm sure we'll get to it some other point, but in terms of the verses that you cited from the beginning of the Torah, where the Torah connects uh, knowledge to death, it's actually the second, third, third chapter of Rishi, but it's interesting, at the end of that chapter, just before the human being has been banished from the Garden of Eden, so God says, to God's retinue or whatever, the human has become like one of us, divine, to know good and evil. And now, lest he stretch out his hand, he's going, God is concerned that the human will, having become, having achieved knowledge, will also eat of the tree of life and be eternal and then be like one of us. And the next verse is Vayigarish et Adam to the human is banished. So it strikes me that what the Torah seems to be suggesting is that you could be like God in one of two ways. You could have knowledge, which is makes you somewhat godlike. You could be eternal. And what God, for whatever God's reasons are, God doesn't want the human to become like God. God wants the human to be human. And I think what the Torah is setting up actually. And that's what banished from Eden and the rest of the book and beyond has to do with how can the human being achieve some measure of, uh, of, of, of immortality, which for the Torah, I think is tied in certainly in Breshit with this idea of, of being covenantal. Because covenantal means you may die, but, uh, but you continue in some way through others that carry on what you have begun. And that I think that well, that actually takes place, I believe, in Breshit in the most striking way is the binding of Isaac. In, 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 in Akedat Yitzchak is where the promise to Avraham that he's going to be confidential is actually reaffirmed in the most striking language. And it takes place, I would say, Dafka, 
in a, in a space where Avram is willing to confront his own mortality because if he sacrifices Isaac, there's no Abraham. There's, his continuity is, that's it. He, he's, he faces complete ob oblivion. And what the Torah seems to be suggesting is that the way you can be a full human is only if you're willing to accept what it means to be human. Maybe that's the deepest knowledge, to come to reality, to, to face the reality of, 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 of our mortality, which means at the end of the day, we are human. And nonetheless, even if, as we affirm our, 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 our humanity and our limitation, we suggest that we can be in some sense immortal, living on through others and, and creating a kind of mutual covenant with God, because the covenant is, is, is in such a mutuality there. So I think that's actually in the study of Rashid, an incredibly important point. I wanted to put that out there. And I also wanted to make one other point about a text that you cited, which is a lot to say about it, but something that I actually brought up in one of my own classes, I think the last, uh, last session, which has to do with that very interesting uh, section you quoted from the Talmud in Shabbat, which says there are four people that died um, without sin. They didn't die because of their own sin, they died because of the Nachash, original sin or whatever, Adam's sin. And that struck me as an incredibly interesting, the, the four that they chose are very interesting. You have Benjamin, you have uh, Amram, that's the second one. Uh, I think Yishai is one, Jesse. And then there's a fourth one, which is Kilal, which is David's third son. And Son, son number two. He's son, actually son number two. He's the one that's born to uh, to uh, Abigail. It's uh, Abigail's child. So it struck me when I see a passage like that. The first thing I ask myself is: Is there some commonality to them? And what is the most striking of the four? Well, the most striking of the four has got to be Kilov because most people don't know he even exists. So what is that actually about? And what struck me was the following thought, which is this: that if you look at David's first four children. The oldest one is Amnon. He's the one that rapes Tamar and he's killed. My son number three, who's, uh, who's Absalom, Absalom is son number three. He's also killed. He takes over the kingship, tries to kill his father. He's killed. Son number four is Adonia, who appears in the beginning of Book of Mulachim, who wants to be king even as his father is dying. And then there's son number two, Kilov, of which we hear absolutely nothing. Zero. And what struck me actually was that what the Talmud may be getting at is when you look at Benjamin, Benjamin in the book of Breshit, he does nothing. He never speaks. He is acted upon. He's a proxy. He does absolutely nothing. Yishai is David's father, but he's not really an active player in any sense. Amram is Moses' father. We know nothing about him. He, he married a woman from the house of Levi. So these are four people, I would say, who are totally uninvolved in the politics, in the struggles. And maybe what the Talmud's getting at is that in this world, if you are involved in the world in a real way, you, can, you can't help but sin. Because if you're involved in this world, if, you, if you're totally uninvolved, if you're a kill-off who, unlike son one, three, and four, just are uninvolved, then maybe you can be so-called innocent or pure but you're not really living in this world. And if you are a Moses, or if you're a J David, or if you're a, the other sons, or a Solomon, or a whatever, uh, that's a different story. So perhaps the, what the, that statement's getting at in terms of sin, sinfulness is that being human means to sin. I, I don't mean in, in a kind of Christian way that you're damned from birth, that kind of thing. I mean, you can't be in this world, and not because you can't, justify everything. But being in the world itself, the way the world has been constructed, where the Kabbalists go, I'm into Shikra. There's so much falsehood in the world. There's so many compromises we have to make that inevitably we, we will be sinful. And that's just part of, part of living. But having said all that, on the other hand, we can create a, a, a we can't be God, but we can create a, a, a relationship with God and then comes back to the first to the first point about covenant being a way to overcome our our, our limitations by affirming our, our by affirming the limitations, affirming our own humanity, then in some sense we can connect to that which is immortal. So those were two thoughts that I had, and maybe we'll pick them up at some point in the future. But 
Yeah, thank you. I want to, I, I want to, um, to, to, to so talk about your first point, right, which is, there is this very surprising insistence um, in the, in the Kabbalistic tradition of the notion that the, that originally people were not supposed to die, that death is a tragedy. It's the product of a fall, right? And uh, that, so, th so there's it's a very strong insistence. It's in the Ramban, it's in the Zohar. Um, it's a really strong, re it's a strong, and maybe it's the shot way of reading, uh, reading Breshit, right? I think it corresponds to the part of ourselves that rages against death, that protests against death, that does not accept death. When Dylan Thomas is his poem addressed to his father, he says, don't just, just don't accept it. He says, do not go gentle into that good night, rage against the dying of the light, right? The idea that death is something to protest, it should not be. It's that side of us, right? The side, the side of us, and it's expressed in these materials by saying, death came into the world as a fall. That wasn't the original idea. We were supposed to be immortal. And it came into the world through a fall. And that fall is then repeated in almost every person's life. But even those who don't or are not involved die anyway because of the original sin. And I see somebody in the chat says, clarify what I mean by the original sin. I can mean two things by it. One is just the first sin, which is the sin of Adam and Eve by eating of the tree of knowledge. But then there's a stronger sense that most people associate with Christianity, the notion that as a result of that first sin, that, that the, 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 the fall of humanity is with us in every subsequent generation. And although people associate, tend to associate that with Christian ideas for whatever reason, it is firmly entrenched in the Jewish tradition. It's really in the pshat of Rishid, the, the God curses the earth. Um, and uh, certainly in the Kabbalistic tradition, it's very, it's very strong. The term chet, chet, original sin is, a, is found in the Ramban and a, the idea is certainly found in the Zohar. Um, and and, and, and the, it's that protest. This was a fall, this should not be. Whereas those who say, no, 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 death was, we were always supposed to be mortal. So just accept it because that's just part of being a human being is the side of us. And I think we all may, maybe most of us have these two sides, the side of us that says, look, spade, it's my natural fate. I have to accept it. It's inevitable. I'm a natural being. I'm natural like the trees and like the, like the, the seasons and, and, and I should accept it as a natural process. And I think many of us or most of us have those two sides raging against death and accepting it as natural. And I think these two sort of religious positions, was, was, were human beings created as immortal and then fell? Or were they always supposed to be mortal? And it's actually a disagreement between, as in so often the case in Jewish thought, between the Rambam, Maimonides, and the Ramban, Nachmanides. The Rambam being more of in the natural camp um, and accepting, accepting of death, and the Ramban protesting against him and said, if that's the case, why do we even have, why is mourning even allowed? Um, in his introduction to his book on, on, uh, on death customs and death law. Um, so, and in response to that, right, what is this tree of life here? Um, somebody put in the chat, the Ramam was a doctor. That has a good, very good point. <laughs> very good point. And not the kind of doctor I am, but like a real doctor, a medical <laughs> doctor. Uh, <laughs> that, that is a very true point. Um, uh, I'm now going to read you a passage, and I'm oh, not. Uh, to... And Nathaniel, I just wanted to make one comment about what you yeah. uh, mentioned before about the idea of the so-called original sin, or that the human is, as I put it, the human is limited and inevitably will fail. As we, you know, if we live in this world, we will encounter our own failures and mistakes and all that. And you see that within the Jewish tradition as well, and certainly that I agree with that. And Jewish tradition there. Within Judaism, there are many traditions. 
But I, I think actually where Judaism uh, perhaps departs from some understandings of Christianity has more to do with how one can overcome the human limitation. I think, I think the Jewish myth actually in Genesis, if you had to pick one story, which, which rep, for me represents the Jewish myth, myth I, by myth I mean a way of seeing the world, it's Jacob wrestling, it's Jacob wrestling with God or wrestling with the angel or whatever. And the idea of self-transformation that Jacob left to his own devices actually is able to overcome who he was and to become a new person without any outside assistance. I mean, God creates a setting for him, but it's Jacob's own struggles. And I think that is a very central, central Jewish myth. I think that. And I think that within Christianity, there's the other myths, which see that perhaps through faith or belief in, in, in God or whatever, or Jesus or whatever it is, but that a human being is incapable alone of, 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 of self-transformation. That's, I think, one of the places where Judaism and Christianity have a very sharp you know, disagreement, I would say, move in different directions, two different ways to see the world and, you know, it's certainly true that very often we don't see ourselves as capable of solving our problems, that's for sure. So, but I just do think that's important to make that point about, about how one can overcome these, these limitations in terms, of, in terms of Genesis, in terms of Israel. That's when we become Israel through our own struggles. And uh, not that Jacob is perfect afterwards either, but, but, he, but, he, but he does it on, whatever he is, it's, it's done by himself on his own. We, you know, Perhaps there's some divine assistance in creating the setting, but it's, but it's Jacob's struggle. I just wanted to add that point. I think that's I think it's an important point. So so I so I don't want to go off on that right now because it would take us far afield. But I I I suspect this might be a difference between us, um, which is what life's all about. Um, uh, uh, but what I do about where you know whether you can divide between there are many Judaisms and many Christianities. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but one thing I do want to say, and without engaging that question right now, what I do want to say is, and, and the, you know, to the group as a whole, is the tell me what your stance is towards death, and I can tell you a lot about what your stance is towards a lot of things. For example, God, right? So I think this divide, for example, between the Rambam and the Ramban about whether death was inevitable or whether it's product of a fall, itself can be related to deeper, to all kinds of differences between them in their understanding of God and their understanding of Judaism and their understanding of mitzvot and their understanding of life. Um, that one's, uh, the one's relationship to death. And this is why this, I think this, the, this theme is so, it's, it's so fraught. And it's also why um, I want to make, why I start off with the 903 ways, right? There are 903 ways of understanding death. And I want to make that clear Right? It's so fraught because it involves everything. And I, and I experienced this from the very first time I taught a class on death that this is the most fraught topic because everyone has some kind of relationship to it, has some kind of stance towards it. And it's very delicate to challenge it. There are 903 ways and they all challenge each other. Um, and I think that the, you know, you could make a division between different kinds of Judaism in terms of their different relationship to death, as well as, you know, between traditions and so forth. Um, I, I, I'm going to put on the screen now a, a passage from the Zohar that will that should shock you, but I'm not going to fully interpret it. I'm just going to put it out there, and we'll talk about it in in subsequent sessions, which talks about the title of this section of tonight's class is. Original sin and death in the divine realm. And that should shock you, unless you're already shock proof or already a heretic. Original sin and death in the divine realm. And I'm going to read this to you. For people who have never studied Kabbalah before, a lot of this will seem incomprehensible, but try to just appreciate it for the poetry. The basics are that in Kabbalah, there is a there are several different faces to God. Some of them are male, some of them are female. The two most important ones here are the, the Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Blessed Holy One, and the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, understood as a male-female couple, and also associated with the sun and the moon, respectively. 
the sun associated with the male blessed holy one, the moon with the female Shekhinah. And the left side is understood as that we're gonna read about is the place of, of strength, which is also associated with the, uh, the space of, or the place of a sexual arousal. And what this passage does, and there are similar passages elsewhere in the Zohar, as well as in other 13th century Kabbalistic texts, it talks about a catastrophe within the divine realm that brings about death to the world, that causes death to enter the world. So this is the notion of an original sin or an original catastrophe, not, not even starting with Adam and Eve in the garden but some kind of original catastrophe that goes on in the divine realm, and that's what causes death. And here we have a serpent, not the snake running around the garden, but some kind of cosmic serpent who gets in the way of divine unity. And again, all this will sound very shocking to people who have not studied Kabbalah, and I'm not going to explain it fully right now. I just want to put it out there to pick it up later in the course. And it goes like this. I'm going to read a little bit in Aramaic just to, so you can hear it, and then I'll go to the English. There is left above in supernal sanctity, arousing love. And this is love between the male and female faces of God, between the Shekhinah and the Kadosh Baruch Hu linking the moon with a sacred site to shine. And the sacred site here is the Blessed Holy One, her, the moon, the Shekhinah, and her male consort, the Kadosh Baruch Hu. So there's a holy kind of erotic love between the male and female divine. But there is left below, and this is the demonic arousal, or the demonic strength, blocking love from above, preventing her, the Shekhinah, from shining through the sun and from drawing near. And this is the dimension of the evil serpent. And the serpent here now is no longer that snake running around the Garden of Eden, but the devil, Samael, um, often called Samael in uh, Jewish tradition and here called the serpent, often associated with the serpent in, in the Zohar, the Chivya, which is serpent in Aramaic. For when this lower left arouses, it pulls It pulls the moon, separating her from above. It separates the divine male from the divine female, so her light darkens, and she cleaves to the evil serpent. This is a, a, a capture um, of an aspect of the divine by an aspect of the demonic. The demonic gets in the way of divine unity, disrupts the holy union between the divine male and female. And she becomes distanced from the tree of life and brings death upon the whole world. So here what we have is the notion that death comes into the world. Why? Because of some kind of catastrophe that goes on in the metaphysical realm and actually in the divine realm. Some kind of disruption goes on within the divine that causes an aspect of the divine, the Shekhinah, to become distanced from the tree of life, which is associated with the, the Blessed Holy One. And as a result of this rupture within the divine, death enters the world. This makes, this makes the origin of death not only a catastrophe as a result of human sin, this makes the existence of death, a result of catastrophe that precedes the human, a result of some kind of cosmic catastrophe. So the raging against the dying of the light that Dylan Thomas wrote about uh, uh, so many decades ago, right, is also a protest against a fall in the cosmos that includes the divine. And this is one of the central Kabbalistic teachings that if there's evil in the world, if there's rupture in the world, if there's tragedy in the world, it must mean that there is some kind of rupture within the divine. Because if the divine is present everywhere, 
then if you look out the window and you see rupture in the world, it's also rupture in the divine. And this is a very uh, uh, earth-shaking, cosmos-shaking Kabbalistic teaching um, about the origin of death. And again, if you're not familiar with Kabbalah at all, it'll sound very shocking and very surprising. If you've studied with me before, you're familiar with this kind of teaching or with the, if you've studied Kabbalah, um, you, you're familiar with this kind of teaching. And I just wanna put it out there, although we'll explore it later, as a certain strand in the Jewish tradition, a protest against death and a view of death as a catastrophe, as a tragedy, as a, as a, as a, as a fall, as a disaster, as a disaster. We often experience death as disasters in our own lives. And here it is, the Kabbalah, the, the Zohar is saying, if there's disaster in the human, there's also disaster in the divine. And somebody put in the chat, the very important question, how can there be a rupture in the divine and yet Hashem remain one? Of course, that is the question of questions that is posed to every uh, uh, Kabbalistic text that was ever written. And there are many, many different answers. And it's another one of those fantastic questions that I don't want to answer, that I never want to answer, that I want to think about. I think all of Kabbalah is written out of that question. All of Kabbalah is written out of the question, how can there be division in the cosmos, including division among people, and yet Hashem is one? It's the Kabbalistic mythological version of the very familiar philosophical question, how can a good, all-powerful God permit evil in the world? That's the philosophical question. The Kabbalists have their own version of the question is, how can there be division in the cosmos and yet all is one? So the Zohar goes on for in great detail and vivid, vivid depictions of rupture in the world and rupture in the divine and finishes almost every, every paragraph with the Aramaic phrase, v'cholachat, and all is one. That's the paradox. Doesn't attempt to answer it. It leaves you with the paradox and I think in a way, all of Kabbalah is written out of that paradox. Nathaniel, are you, are you suggesting that this text that you just read, which is very interesting, obviously, are you suggesting or are you thinking that, that that text suggests that death in this world is a result of a divine rupture? Or are you, are you suggesting that it simply mirrors it? Because if it's, if it's the cause, of, if, if it's the cause, then presumably it's not the sin of the human being that caused it. It's already caused prior to that by divine rupture. Or are you saying, no, it's just, it's, it's, it's parallel to, but it's not causative in any sense. Okay. Um, I'm asking, I'm, what, what you, you know, saying? I know I'm, I'm gonna say, uh, uh, I'm not suggesting, I'm just reading the text, right? I, you know, uh, uh, I like, you know, I, 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 at this stage of my life, I like to think of myself as a simple malamid, right? I'm just teaching the text. I'm just reading the text. One of our great, greatest, most central texts. And what it literally says is, and therefore this caused death to the whole world. So this text, right, explicitly says that's where death comes from, is this catastrophe within the body. There are many other texts in the Zohar that attributes death to Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. But here's the thing, and, and again, I just want to suggest this tonight and, and without going, going through the whole Kabbalistic thing, is for the Zohar, everything that happens on one level happens at all levels. So the difference between those two alternatives that you've just laid out is less sharp in the, in the Zoharic vision uh, than, than, than one might think. But so I just want to put that out there uh, um, the question of whether the divine and the human mirror each other, cause each other, reflect each other, are metaphors for each other, all those possible readings are there in the Zohar. In this particular text, it's quite, it's quite clear uh, that this catastrophe in the divine is like the catastrophe of the garden. They talk about the serpent separating the, the female from the male, distancing her from the tree of life. It's clearly modeled on the scene in the garden. And it's, it's also clearly about the divine. It's this, the divine sun and the divine moon. Right, okay. it reminds me of what the, uh, what the Eish Kodesh, I think, said towards the end, uh, the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, Holy Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto. 
but he talked initially he was talking about we have to we have to we must be sinning etc and at some point he says you know it's not about us it's a war between Amalek and God and we're caught in the middle it's not about our sin there's a divine conflict taking place and we're we're, we're caught in the middle of it and that's one way to understand it which I find very appealing I would add but that's one way to understand it. That sounds sounds like this text suggests such a such 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 thinking. The, the I mean the Ace Kodesh was that he was clearly deeply immersed in obviously in in Kabbalistic thought and uh, uh, no question what you're saying. And the there's a anyway for that. I wanted to just put on uh, uh, now that I that I hope that I've I've given you a lot to imagine and think, and with this last text from the Zohar, perhaps even be shocked at the theological boldness of Kabbalistic visions, and specifically thinking about death and this difference between protesting against death and, and accepting it as natural. And again, I think two stances that we may all have, existential stances. I wanna finish with a Talmudic story, fairly well-known Talmudic story, perhaps for people, certainly people <laughs> teaching or thinking about death, um, that has a very interesting, much less shocking and much less uh, uh, challenging, but a story um, about death and the fear of death, intimacy with death, and specifically with the angel of death. And the Talmudic rabbis, there are many stories about them chatting with the angel of death and their intimacy with the angel of death and, and hanging out with him and fooling him and, and, and all kinds of things. Um, and with the fear of death, right? And there's something about the story that I find incredibly profound and also the difference between thinking about death in an intellectual way versus thinking about it existentially and emotionally. And it's this story from Moed Katan. And there are a number of stories about people sitting at the, at the deathbeds of their teachers and chatting with them about it. So Rava, while seated at the bedside of Rabbi Nachman, so I'm sinking into slumber. And there's again, this word, uh, it, it says minam nem, which means he's sort of like nodding off, right? Again, this is this relationship between death and, and, and sleep. Rabbi Nachman said, master, the, the dying man says to his student, master, tell the angel of death not to torment me. Because he obviously sees the angel of death there. And there's lots in, there's passages we'll look at in, in the Talmud about what the angel of death actually looks like. Rabbi said, are you master, not a highly respected man? By which he meant, why don't you tell him yourself? You're, you're a, you know, you're a chashuva guy. You're an important fellow. You should be able to, to uh, 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 make this plea to the angel of death. And Rabbi Nachman says to him, and this incredibly profound moment, said Rabbi Nachman to him, who is respected? Who is regarded? Who is distinguished? in the eyes of the angel of death. It's this notion that, that, that in, in relationship to death, there's a, a sense of human equality. Um, there, are many, there are many expressions of this in literature. Um, uh, for my class, my college class, I played them some blues songs about death. There's a song that says, we all go back to mother earth and the verses of the song are about, doesn't matter how rich you are, how beautiful you are, how poor you are, how happy you are, unhappy you are, at the end, we all go back to Mother Earth. It's a notion of equality before death. And so Rabbi Nachman says, I may have been an important person in my lifetime, but who is important before the equality of death? Very, very sobering um, thing here. And then he goes on, the story goes on and says, and Rabbi says to him, Master, please show yourself to me. In other words, what he means is after you die, come, come back to me in a dream. And after Rav Nachman died, he did appear to Rava in a dream because he, he said he would, or his student asked him to, so he did. And Rava asked him, did you suffer pain upon death, master? And he replied, it was as gentle as the removal of a hair from milk. Okay, so you know, if there's a hair in milk, you have to draw it out extremely gently, right? It's a very delicate process. So this taking of my soul from my body was as gentle as the removal of a hair from milk. 
I didn't suffer at all. I had no physical pain. But that's not the end of the story. But then he goes on. But were the Blessed Holy One to say to me, go back to that world, in other words, to the world of the living as you were, I would not want to. For the fear of death is too great. This is a story I think is so profound. He's saying, I know that it wasn't painful. I know it wasn't painful. I, I, I experienced it. I know I wasn't painful. And yet I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't go back to life if you paid me. Because even though I know it up here in my head, I know that to be a human being is to be in existential dread of death, no matter what I know in my head. And that paradox, I think, is, is reflected in a lot of the Jewish materials on death. And, and I think it's what, it's what their honesty is. So, you know, people often say, oh, he's dead, but he's in a better place, right? He's in a better place. Don't mourn, he's in a better place. Or the secular version of it is, he's now become part of the trees and the soil and the flowers, right? And it minimizes the grief that we feel upon death and the dread we have of death, the grief we feel upon the death of a loved one. It's a, it's a dishonesty to say, well, they're in a better place. Right? That's why in Jewish tradition, you do not comfort mourners before the burial. You're not allowed to say, don't comfort a mourner before the way says, when, when, when the dead, when the corpse is in front of him. Don't comfort them at that point, because that would be a lie. Right? You'd be lying, they'd be lying, they'd be mad at you. It's, it's a lie to say that at that point. And in these Jewish texts, there are descriptions of paradise, of reward after death that are mind-blowingly beautiful. And yet, all the texts describe the moment of death really as a moment of horror. And actually a moment associated with, in, in the Kabbalistic material, certainly with the diabolical, um, with the demonic side of the universe, even the texts that also describe a reward after death as being the most beautiful, amazing, mind-blowing trip you could possibly go on, they none of them discount the cataclysmic crowing of the black rooster at the moment of each and every individual human being's death. And that's a paradox. That's not a philosophical proposition. It's strictly speaking contradictory to take on board both of those things at the same time, that death is horrifying and a cosmic catastrophe, whether by the crowing of the black rooster or the fall, the rupture within God, even the very texts that affirm that after death, people go on to this unbelievably great experience um, that is, is far better than anything you could experience on earth. That I think is the honesty of the Jewish traditions about death, one of the great honesties of them. Um, and uh, that's what I wanted to say tonight. Um, let, let me see if I've, David, do you want to say something? I want to look at some of these questions. Uh, just uh, to, just maybe we'll pick this up next time, but just to, uh, to underscore what you had said about the, the, um, the, I, the idea that the mourner prior to burial, after the death of a relative that one mourns for, that the mourner, according to the Talmud, the Babwi is exempt from performing mitzvot, and according to the Yerushalmi, he's actually forbidden to. A point that Rabbi Soloveitchik would emphasize, incredible halacha, that you're actually forbidden to do mitzvot, which he saw as questioning. It's, it's really a question about, about meaning, about life. What is the point? And I think that is what one considers upon the death of someone, and perhaps contemplating one's own death as well, is it calls into question the idea of significance, the idea of meaning, which I think is part of the terror. And and I think that the Jewish tradition gives space for that, actually, I think, as you were saying. It, and I think that to be able to confront death honestly, which I believe, um, at least in, in parts of Western culture that I've lived in, is a fear to confront death. And I think that within Jewish tradition, and my own experience, I grew up with basically with, with, with survivors, that death was a very natural thing. 
They don't come out of Auschwitz. They lost their wives, husbands, children. They lived with death. And for them, death was nothing. It was part of life, actually. That's how they saw it. But I think in big pieces of Western culture, at least that I have seen and lived with, uh, there's an attempt to deny death. The funeral, someone else does it, and it's all pristine and all that. And I think the tradition very much in general opposes that. So I, you know, I think to confront it, to confront reality, to, to live honestly. And I think our tradition is very much in favor of honest confrontation, even when it's very painful and shocking and, and frightening. That's what add that. I guess we'll pick these things up later, but yeah, just wanted to add that point. Yeah, and and I you know I I maybe even should have started off with that point. Um, and I that it is something that all you know many people write about death today you know, make this point about, about the, in the name of a, a book that was once famous uh, in, in mid-century, The Denial of Death, um, which has really been going on in Western society probably for a couple of hundred years, the moving of dying into hospitals, the moving it away from, away from, you know, people being uncomfortable with it, not, 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 it, it's not something to think about, it's something to avoid, to not talk about, um, it's almost shameful, um, and that, you know, I think that uh, uh, many people, when they have their first true mourning experience in the in in the Jewish tradition, uh, really understand the wisdom, the great great wisdom of so many of our of our mourning customs. And um, actually, David and I grew up in the same neighborhood, which was a the, a, a neighborhood heavily populated by Holocaust survivors, um, and death was, or you know, discussions of death were everywhere. Uh, and I guess we're almost at the end of time here. I just want to say that um, uh, we read a lot of <laughs> Elie Wiesel growing up, living in a survivor's community. Um, it was only when I grew up and started studying Kabbalah that I realized how many images um, in, in Wiesel's writing come straight out of Kabbalah. Um, his portrayals of death, in particular, the, the notion of uh, the eyes and something we'll look at. Well, actually, that's already in 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 uh, in in Talmudic writing, this notion of death and, and the omnipresence of eyes um, is something that is an image that Elie Wiesel uses that really comes straight out of the tradition, um, as well as the various other images that he talks about. Um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, we, we certainly, people of our age, you know, grew up with knowing people who had known death very, very intimately, but really, really all human beings, if they're honest and they look around and they look at the people around them, uh, 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 have that experience. Um, and these texts, and I, I'm going to include on this, is that um, we're going to look at a lot of these texts. A lot of them have these mythological images. I think one of the great uh, services that these render is it gives us a way to explore uh, this imagination of death, um, this undiscovered country in Shakespeare's words, um, this the language to explore it, not in the language of abstract philosophy or abstract theory or propositions, not even trying to reconcile things, right? For one of the great advantages to exploring it in myth and story um, in mythology is being able to sit with contradictory feelings, contradictory images, contradictory stances, including this, this contradiction, I think that's very well expressed in this Talmudic story between the intellect, what, into what's known intellectually and what is experienced existentially. Um, and I see we're at, it's 9.20, which I understand is our cutoff time. So thank you all for coming. I hope to see you next time. Um, and somebody asked for the source sheets. Um, if you are registered for the course, I will, I sent out a preliminary version of them to those who were registered yesterday and other, there are other people. Um, so I will send it to the, to the list uh, uh, tonight, the mm -hmm. final version of the sources. Yes, Just to easy. elaborate, uh, the source sheets are also in the chat right now. So everyone oh, uh, should have gotten them in, in the chat, but that's great if anyone uh, wants it emailed uh, as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Berman, for this interesting class. I'm looking forward to uh, next week. And thank you to everyone who joined us today on Zoom and Risha Live and on Facebook. So good to have you with us. Uh, we continue our spring program tomorrow at 8 p.m. with a class on the legacy of the 10 plagues with Dr. Malka Simkovich. And in addition, we always have many more classes um, happening. You can find out more information as well as the registration links at our website, www.drisha.org classes. 
And thanks again, uh, Dr. Um, Berman and Rabbi Silver for the opportunity to uh, learn with you. And we hope to see everyone again at one of our upcoming classes here at Drisha. Thank you so much.